just want somebody who believes they can. And they have this fire. Church is an ark. Your ministry is an ark. Your business is an ark. Your purpose. But until you attach emotion to it, it's never written in the back We're into your... That didn't work. We're finished. No. Passionate people said that didn't work, but something will. Something Socrates wanted to get a message to this young man. And this was his message. Hello, everyone. This is Martin Williams from Omaha, Nebraska, the Ambassadors Worship Center. I'm here because I want you to get excited about the purpose you were born. There's passion in you, and we have to find it. Get ready for this awesome program. It's going to change your life. <laughs> I mean, you can almost feel the king in the room. Well, I can. Maybe you can almost, but I can feel him. You know, regalia. Feel it. Okay. I will obey instructions given to me. <laughs> this is where I stopped off today, the state of the church. The state of the church. Well, right, this is what I skipped. I know you're keeping up with me. All right. Uh, the state of the church. Write these down. The first state of the church I want you to be reminded of is the unconsciousness of the church. And I'll give you a scripture in just a minute. The unconsciousness of the church. Secondly, the church right now is culturally incompetent. Thirdly, the church is unprepared to rule. It's conferences like this that get us in a position that we can be ready to rule. Amen? The scripture I want to use is Matthew 11 and 16. And then we'll wrap this up. This is Jesus talking. Jesus says, but what shall I liken this generation to? What is this generation like that we are in? He asked the question, then he answered it. It is like children sitting in the marketplaces, calling to their companions and saying, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We mourned to you. You did not lament. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he is, he has a demon. But the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But the last verse, read it with me. But wisdom is justified by her children. One more time. But wisdom, in other words, Jesus says wisdom gives birth to something. Wisdom gives birth to something. But back up to the top of that verse, Jesus asks, what's the generation like? Then he describes it. The generation is like children in the marketplaces. So when he compared, if we compare the church to this statement, Jesus is saying this. Have you ever taken your children with you to do serious business? Have you ever taken your children with you to do serious business? I'm asking a question. Did you ever end up in a situation to handle serious stuff and your children were with you? Maybe you haven't, but I have. I've been trying to do serious stuff, and my little kids were there. And the little children would carry on in games while I was trying to carry on business. They are distracted by what's around them because right over their heads, something is happening that they cannot perceive. Jesus says the church is like children in the marketplace. What is the marketplace? Don't miss Dr. Monroe in the morning. You've never heard it, so you need to be here. When you talk about marketplaces, marketplaces are places where there's an exchange, an exchange of ideas, an exchange, exchange for products and money, an exchange. I mean, at marketplaces is where the stuff really happens. The stuff that contains life doesn't really happen at church. It happens in the marketplaces. So Jesus said the church is like children in the marketplaces. And right over our heads, right over our heads, deals are being made. Right over our heads, exchanges are happening. Right over our head, political parties are taking control. Right over our heads, companies are being bought and sold. Right over our heads, deals are being made at the city level, at the state level, at the governor's level, and at the presidential, uh, presidential level. Right over our heads, we are unconscious to power being exchanged around us. We are unconscious to the concept 
that the kingdom is not just alive and well, but the kingdom desires to thrive and take over. That's the state of the church. It has to change. Do you agree? The state of the church has to change. This is what Jesus said as he continued to describe this. Woe to you teachers and teachers of the law and and Pharisees. You're hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. And when he becomes one, you make him twice. Twice as much a person of hell, the son of hell, as you are. In other words, we go around the world to reach people. And God is trying to hide these lost people from us. Because we are unconscious and we turn them into sons of hell. Those are his words, not mine. That as we go into the world to preach to the lost and get them saved, they are, they are better off not saved and not being in contact with us. They are better off not meeting a Christian because we Christians are going to take them out of glory. We're going to take them out of glory and put them in Christendom. We're going to stuff them in that tank we're not happy with. We're going to put them in this tank of artificialness. We're going to stuff them in this world where they really don't have power to thrive. So Jesus says, we turn people into worse things than they were before they met our Jesus. So the church can become the problem of heaven. The church can actually become the enemy of the true message of the kingdom. The church can be the person or the people who don't go into the kingdom and then block the way intentionally for others to go in. What if the church has become God's problem? We need new church. Amen? Finishing. We went through this today. I'm going to move past that. You remember that, right? You know what that is? Right? This, env- this environment, this environment, this is the kingdom. This is the kingdom. This is the mass array of species, the, the flow of living water, the, the experience beyond this little fish tank. We have to get out of just Christ- Christendom is in the kingdom, but it's not the kingdom. Christendom Christ-likeness is in the kingdom, but it doesn't describe the totality of what the kingdom is. And I'll tell you right now, we have Muslims in our church. They come every Sunday. We have Hindus in our church. They come every Sunday. This is what Dr. Monroe told me the first time he told me. I received this standing in front of him, and then I walked away murmuring. I did not believe what he said. It took a few months for me to get it. He said, everyone is looking for the kingdom. And they are. And they will stomach your Jesus until you point to them what the kingdom is. And once they know that he brought the kingdom, they may accept him. Hindus, Jews, they come to church when they hear the kingdom because they want out of their tank too. There's no life in this tank for them. So they're looking for us to help. This is where we're in tonight. What is favor? I'm not flipping the script or changing the subject. This goes right along with the kingdom message because what we need is favor. Favor is what's getting ready to happen to you. A minute ago when Pepe was teaching, my God, and the presence of God fell in this room. The Lord said what's coming next is I'm going to begin to invite people into what I'm doing. I'm going to start talking to people and inviting them into what I'm doing to grow this kingdom. And then I'm going to give them favor favor they've never seen. Dr. Monroe taught us years ago that once the king gives you favor, no one can take it away. So what is favor? How does favor work? Who does favor follow? Very simply, favor is the irresistible charisma of Christ that wraps itself around you. Favor is the environment of heaven on you, on earth. Favor is the magnet that attracts everything good to you. 
How does favor work? Am I going too fast? I'm trying to get you in out of here. Okay, I'll go back to that screen. You can write them down. The, 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 the favor of God comes upon you when you begin to agree with him. Stay tuned. We'll be right back for more. Welcome back. Here's more of this powerful message. You hear what I'm saying? Got to move on. Just, just buy the thing over there. Just get it, take it home, and hang out. How does favor work? Favor is the attraction of God. Read that with me. Favor is the attraction of God and other resources to you that releases and through you so that others like and trust you so that they will cooperate with you. Favor. See, what we're going to have to have to turn this thing around is favor. We're going to have to get the king to speak to us. And we're going to have to give, get the king to give us favor on the planet. God said this to me a few, a few years ago. He said, we, you got the money, you got the land. You got 50 acres, you got the money. Go and build a $3 million project over there. Just go do it. The favor of God. And I'm saying, oh, that's wonderful. And two weeks later, say this with me. God is Jehovah Nisi. Say God is Jehovah Rophi. Now say God is also Jehovah Sneaky. He is Jehovah Sneaky. He gets you out there, doesn't tell you everything, doesn't even tell you why, and before you know it, your buddy's in a sling. But God is never in trouble. So here we are. We've spent $100,000 on this project. I mean, 500000 on this project that the saints raised. And now God says, I don't want you to build that now. I, there's a building I want. It's 15 acres. It's prime land sitting on top of the hill. Worth $7 million. I'd already asked the saints for money to spend 500000 on this. He said, I want that building. I said, Lord, that's the Walmart. That's the biggest building available now. That's a lot of money. He said, I know. But I want the building. Now, I'd never heard that before. He said, I want the building as a testimony of me. I don't care about you. I want the building. And if I could come buy it, I would come buy it. But the only way I get the building is if I got to find somebody to buy this building. And the Lord said this, these words to me. He said, don't worry. I will give you favor. Favor is when God, something about you, attracts God to you. Favor is when there's something about how you think, about the way he thinks, that he shows up in your space. Like Pepe was talking, favor is when God falls in love with you and he interferes in your atmosphere. He just kind of comes. But there's something in you that attracts him. And it's simply this. You understand kingdom. Something about you is about the kingdom. So now God makes a choice. Do I help the Christian or do I help the kingdom citizen who's trying to do something for me? You can be dumb but have favor. You can be ignorant and have favor. I mean, a minute ago, Pepe is talking, and I got, I needed an excedrin. My mind doesn't work like that, and I'm like, the guy's smart. Worship him. But I don't understand a word he's saying. It wasn't until the presence of the Lord came that I caught up. But favor doesn't care about your intellect. Favor does not care about your degree and your pedigree. Favor does not care about what your learning is. Favor ignores skin color. Favor ignores sex and gender. Favor ignores what kind of education you got. Favor doesn't care. Favor wraps around you and you, how many, raise your hand if, if anybody's ever said to you, we don't normally do this. Uh, raise your hand if people have said, uh, uh, the, this is against the rules. Raise your hand if someone has said to you, don't tell anybody, I did this for you. That is favor. And see, Dr. Monroe taught us years ago, when the door of favor opens up, don't be messing around and don't be getting into self-humility and don't, don't be getting into weird stuff. If the door opens, walk through the door. 
And, and Dr. Monroe teaches us that once the door opens, don't stop walking. Because the doors, if one door favor is open, he says to us, that means the king has spoken. So you just keep walking till the door is closed. So we bought the building. We Listen, we bought the building. It was a war to buy the building. $7 million building, we got it for under, for under four, three and a half. Then the Lord said, I'm going to give you favor with me and everybody. The day we closed on the building, I went golfing. Went to a restaurant with my son, and a man walked up to me and said, you're Pastor Williams. He was a millionaire business owner. He said, you bought that Walmart. I said, yes, sir. He said, I don't like you right now, and please help me understand what happened. He said, I am a non-believer. I offered them six and a half million dollars for the building. I said, you need to let me buy you lunch because there are some things you don't understand about my king. My king, my king doesn't work like that. You can't, my king don't need no money. No, no, no. My, my king, he does not need any money. I said, I said, God did not want a tire business there. He wanted an embassy. This building is on the highest point of our city. It is the high place. And the king needed it. So I bought him lunch. And I said, let me tell you about my king. When my king opened doors of favor, no one can close them. See, what you, see, what, what you don't understand is this. Dr. Monroe invited us into his aquarium. And you have been, you have been, your gills have now been infected with fresh water. You have now seen that you don't have to eat plankton anymore. There are bigger fish out there for you to know on. So when you get home, there's going to be stuff you didn't see before. But when you get home, you're going to see it with your eyes. And now tell your neighbor, when God gives you favor, it's not up to you when to stop. See, favor is none of your business. Favor has nothing to do with you, but everything to do with the king. When the king comes upon you with favor, you can't tell God one business is enough. You can't tell God one Academy Award is enough. You can't tell God one NBA championship is enough. That is only up to the king. He decides how much favor you need. That is not you. That's him. Why does God want you? $1 million may not be enough. A billion might be the number God has given to you. Why? Because one day the king is going to come to you and ask for what he gave you. Somebody say favor. We got to finish. Who does favor follow? Very simply. Favor follows the person who has set their lives to cooperate with the will of the king. Favor follows those who accept the new assignment. Favor follows those who have said yes to the king. They don't know what they're saying yes to. Because Jehovah's sneaky. He will, he will get you in trouble. Y'all know Jehovah's sneaky will get you in trouble. God came to Moses and said, listen, Moses, I want you to go free those people. Yes, Lord, I'll go to, tell Pharaoh, let thy people go. The next verse, God says, now you go tell them to let them, let them go, and I'm going to tell Pharaoh, don't let them go. So God can even call you to do something that he's saying no to. But it doesn't matter if you're walking with the king. He's got a plan. But favor follows you when you just say yes to the Lord. Listen, y'all got all those, didn't you? Stay tuned. We'll be right back for more. Welcome back. Here's more of this powerful message. Listen to Daniel 7. I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the ancient of days came and a judgment was made in, 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 in favor of the saints. And when God makes a decision for your favor, can I tell you something? The Bible said of Daniel, Daniel found favor. And the king exalted him above all the other governors. The Bible says that Esther found favor in the sight of Boaz. 
The Bible says that Joseph found favor in the eyes of Pharaoh. The Bible says that Joseph found favor in the eyes of Potiphar. The Bible says of Mary, you have been highly Favor comes to you when you've looked in the king's face and said, King, whatever you're doing is what I'm doing. Wherever you're going is where I'm going. Whatever you're interested in is what I'm interested in. The king shows up to you. He shows up where you are. The biggest part of favor that freaks me out a little bit is Nehemiah. Listen to, listen to this. Nehemiah works for the king who has ravaged his city. He's torn down the city and burnt the gates. But Nehemiah prays this prayer, Lord, if I have found favor, not in the eyes of that king. His prayer is, if I found favor in the eyes of the king of kings, tell him to bid my request. Nehemiah went to the king who had burned his city and asked for money to rebuild it. Why did God put me in Omaha? I know why he put me in Omaha. Omaha is the richest city per capita in the United States. There are more millionaires in my city than there are in any other city per capita. There are more billionaires in the 50 mile radius of Omaha than any other city on the, on the planet. I'm telling you the truth. God put me there to not only become a millionaire, but to become a billionaire and to sap out of Warren Buffett and all these other people.